Thank you. Um, good. Um, my name is Wim Remis. I'm a security consultant working in Belgium, and I'm going to talk about OSEC today. Um, there's a lot of information about me on the internet, and there's a great tool that's called Maltigo. I don't know if ever, everybody has ever used it, uh, but if you find my phone number, you can call me and we can um, go and have a beer. There's three things I want to show you first um, before we go into OSEC. Um, I was a volunteer at the Brucon conference uh, in Brussels last year. I don't know if everybody, uh, anybody has uh, visited Brucon. Um, we're going to have another event this year in September. If you have something interesting to talk about, the CFP will be open, I think, somewhere this month or next month. Um, and anyway, it's a, it's a very good conference. Um, it was awesome last year, and I'm sure it will be awesome this year also. Then I was lucky to be invited uh, to ExcaliburCon, which was a security conference in China. We're going to have uh, another um, edition this year also. I know it's a stupid picture, and I'm very happy that I'm not in it, but <laughs> um, good. If you ever want to combine security and China, this is, a, this is the place to be. And then the third thing uh, that I'm involved in is the Eurothrust Security uh, podcast. Um, it's me, Craig Balding, um, Chris John Riley, and Dale Pearson. Um, we met at Brucon, and we were all listening to, to podcasts. The problem was that all the podcasts that we listened to were hosted by US people, and there was no Eurocentric podcast. So we, we are trying, really trying, to make a European podcast um, using very basic tools, and it's fun to do, and I think we provide some information that you m might find interesting. Um, if there's something we're doing wrong after listening to the first episodes, don't hesitate to give us feedback on that. So, on OSSEC, um, I'm not a developer of OSSEC, I have to make that clear, I'm not a developer at all. Um, I'm, I started as a user of OSSEC, and I've uh, talked with uh, Daniel Sitt, who is the lead developer of OSSEC, uh, a few times. Um, my job is merely to, uh, to introduce OSSEC to, to the community and make people use it more um, to do their log management and uh, system protection. So the tool is developed by da Daniel Sitt. Um, somewhere before 2005, he, had, uh, he was using Tripwire, which you probably know, on a, on a lot of systems. And he had a lot of problems managing those, uh, those logs. So he started developing, uh, starting from a problem he had himself. Um, and that dev developed into SysCheck. It was the first name of OSSEC. Then he started building tools around it. And in 2005, he released the for first open source version. Um, it's licensed under the GPL v V3. Um, now, the tool itself was very good, but there was no support on it. And Daniel Sitt was uh, doing most of the development in his, uh, in his free time. And then he had the opportunity uh, to join Ter Brigade. Ter Brigade was a small company uh, involved in security projects. The project stayed open source, uh, and they provided uh, support on it. So you could, could get commercial support, but the product stayed open source. And in 2008, Third Brigade was um, acquired by Trend Micro, which you know as a big security co company. And there have been doubts um, about the product staying open source. But I've done a talk at ESA a few uh, weeks ago, and there was a guy from uh, Trend Micro in the, in the audience there. And he, he vowed that it was still going to be open source and it would remain open source. <coughs> uh, the agenda for today. First, I have to introduce you in the, into the boring parts of log management, the theory behind it. Then we're going to dig into the OSEC features, a little bit of the OSEC architecture, and then I'm going to introduce you how to do log analysis, how it works, and how you can do your own log, log analysis on any log that you have from any application, from any system that you uh, might want to install OSEC on. So, log management, it's so easy that even the babies can do it. It isn't, okay. There's a lot of sources that logs can come from. First, biggest problem on all, all systems if it, if it involves security, there's users interacting with our applications. If there weren't any users, there wouldn't be any need to do log management, there would, wouldn't be any need for applications either, but good. Um, then we have the applications, databases behind it, uh, the systems, and they all generate enormous amounts of logs. What I've learned is we look at logs 
uh, only when there's a problem, to see what, what has happened. Uh, if we could, that, could do that proactively, it would be very nice. The reasons why we do log management, I think there's only two. Because we have to, because there's requirements, reg regulatory requirements, uh, it can be an internal policy, it can be uh, some, somebody requiring you to do log management. Then you have to. And then there's very few because they want to. I haven't met any yet. <laughs> if we're going to look at logs, you know, in any corporate system, you're not going to have only uh, things logging to, to syslog, but you're going to have um, uh, your, your Windows logs, um, your net, network appliances will uh, have their own proper format of logs. Um, it's a big mess. Then, if we talk about log standards, the first, log, uh, the first standard that comes up is, uh, is syslog. I think you all know syslog. The problem is that it has been abused a lot. Which, with abuse, I mean um, there's de developers. I don't have any, anything against developers, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Oh, or I would be wearing armor. Um, but we're, we're dumping uh, chunks of source code in, uh, in a syslog. We're dumping uh, usernames, passwords, um, even credit card numbers in, in syslog messages. And if we're going to do proper application logging, most of the times we only find um, cryptic strings that don't mean nothing to somebody analyzing the log. Um, it might mean something to the developer behind the application, but if you're going to put it in production, it's going to be a big problem. Um, then there's a second type of locks, um, which are the propri proprietary locks. Um, there's been efforts by um, WebSense, by IBM, uh, and then the last one is uh, CEF, is from ArcSight. They, they thought they were the if, if they were the biggest one, everybody would be, would be adopting their, their log standard. It hasn't happened. There's some applications now uh, moving to CEF. ArcSight is one of the big uh, SIEM, Security Incident and Event Management uh, solutions. And some applications are already moving to CEF, but it's not too big. Um, so we know what happens when a proprietary standard tries to be the big standard. It never happens. Um, and then we have IDMF, which was an awesome initiative by some academics. Uh, it was very complex, uh, and it wasn't in relation with what you see in a production environment. So it, it didn't materialize either. Most recently, oh, that was the next slide, good. Um, what do we need if we want to talk about log management? We need to have a language that everybody agrees upon. Um, we also need a syntax so that every log, uh, log message um, looks, this, looks the same, so everybody can understand it. Then we talked about um, syslog f uh, first. Syslog, by standard in the R RFC, it's UDP. If you're going to roll out syslog in a production environment, the first engineer that you're going to meet is um, going to try to move you to syslog ng. Syslog ng is, a, is an awesome tool, it's also very flexible to get your log management, and it supports TCP. But TCP is not in the standard. Um, you, you need to be able to, to, do your, um, to use a transport according to the, to the message that you want to send. Some messages might want to use UDP, but if you need more, log, uh, more logging, in, in case of an incident, you might want to move to TCP. Um, and then we need uh, recommendations that guidelines that everybody can use to do, to their, do their log management. Um, and there isn't many of that either. There is one, one initiative from, uh, from NIST, which is a US organization uh, that you might, might want to check out. Um, but it's about the only one that gives proper recommendations for log management. Then, uh, more recently, there's become the common event expression. Um, that, that is a a standard that might make it, because it's very flexible. You can uh, do binary, binary logs, you can do plain text logs, you can use uh, XML uh, for logs, depending on what logs you want and what, uh, what, in which case a log um, event happens. Now, for OSEC, 
OSEC is uh, defined on the website as a host intrusion detection system, which means it's something you install on a, on a system to detect intrusions. Um, it's much more flexible than just, just that description. The three main future features of uh, OSEC are log analysis, so you can have it consume logs, um, interpret, them, interpret them, and uh, have uh, thrown alerts or have reaction to, to that log message or log, log messages. Then uh, the inter integrity control, you can monitor several uh, folders on your system. And when a file changes, an alert can be thrown um, with the active response, which is a part of, the, um, of OSEC. You can have the original file put back. So you remain, uh, your system remains, uh, the integrity is, is controlled. And then the rootkit detection, it's not, um, it's, it's not a replacement for any anti-malware solution, but it's a, basic, um, it's a basic set of signatures for, um, for configurations that are uh, interpreted as, uh, as rootkits. When we dig into the architecture, there is, first I have to touch upon the install modes. You can install OSEC in three modes, which is standalone for a web server or a server that you have in a DMZ that you want to have uh, intrusion detection on, you can just install it in standalone mode. Once you have multiple servers uh, or multiple clients, you're gonna want to install the agent version on the, on the clients and have a central server for the, um, for, the, for the log management. The good thing about that part is that the agent runs on the system, but it doesn't do any, any analysis on the system itself. Um, it means it's very low f footprint on, on, your, uh, on your server, and all the computation is going to be done on the, um, on the OSX server itself. And if you do it on the OSX server, you're also going to be able to do, cor do correlation of events. If somebody is scanning multiple servers in your, um, in your environment with Nmap like we um, learned before, then you're going to be able to, to correlate those events. The two Two main processes that are running on the client uh, are the log collector, and that is in fact the only process that is running as root, because you need root access to, to access most of the system logs. Uh, and that's the only reason. The only thing that it does is read the system logs uh, and any new messages are forwarded to the agent. The agent is uh, responsible for communicating with, the, communicating with the server, and all communication is um, encrypted and compressed the standard port for, uh, for OSEC is uh, UDP 1514. You know 514 from, uh, from syslog, so they just put a one in front of it. Um, then the server receives uh, all the communication from the agent, and it's gonna forward the, the messages to the analysis daemon. If there is an event thrown, uh, you can have two actions. You can have um, a mail sent, either to the system manager or you can configure to, to have, for a certain application, a mail sent to the application owner or the application developer, so you can act upon that message. Um, and then a very nifty fe feature for me is the uh, execd, which allows you to, to run a script in reaction to an event. Um, a very good example is on, at DEF CON, they, you, DEF CON is a security conference in the US, uh, they usually have a, what they call a pwn to own contest, there, there is a box that uh, they put there. If you can hack it, the box is yours. And in 2007, there was a guy who um, configured the, the system to do an R poisoning attack once somebody tried to um, in, intrude into that system. It was never hacked, uh, and he used OSSEC and SCAPI, the SCAPI libraries, to, to do that. So, if you have... Uh, a com complex architecture, you're going to have all your clients running the OSSEC client and you're going to have your central server. Um, that's interesting, but you don't get a good overview of your complete uh, infrastructure. Luckily, your firewall, your switch and your routers, you cannot install an agent on it because they're closed, um, but you can have them report uh, using syslog to your, to your uh, OSSEC server and you can interpret that, those logs as well. So we have servers, we have our network infrastructure. Um, 
but maybe we have uh, installed an intrusion detection system on, on our network as well. We can have that report into um, OSEC as well. Um, SNORT is by, by default supported, so OSEC already has a whole set of rules to, to read OSEC messages, um, SNORT messages. Then, of course, we have applications, we have databases. Um, we can monitor those logs as well. We just point the OSEC agent, because applications and the database are running on our servers. Um, we point the agent to, to those log files, and the agent will consume those as well. And then, if we're going to do virtualization, you can install the, the agent on any Linux or Unix-based system. So even a VMware ESX, you can install the OSEC agent on. And with that, you have a complete uh, centralization of your, of your infrastructure logs. These are the rules that are by default um, included in the OSEC package. package. So you, you see um, there's Solaris rules, there is uh, SonicWall, Cisco, Asterisk, Apache. And you can create using the local rules, you can um, create exceptions or extensions on the um, uh, existing rules. One, one thing to note, if you're going to change a rule in one of the uh, application-specific rules, those are going to be overwritten during, uh, during upgrade, but the local rules XML file will never be overwritten. How, how are we going to do uh, log analysis? I already told you that everything happens on the server. Um, the first thing he's going to do is pre-decoding. At that moment, he's going to get basic SM, um, information from the, from, the, from the log message, um, but not going to do in-depth analysis on it. Then in the decoding part, we're going to extract a lot more information, like IP addresses, usernames, host names, um, and specific strings. And in the analysis, we're going to give meaning to that, uh, to that information. We're going inter to interpret it and we're going to make it clear. So, this is an example of a pre-decoding rule. The only thing that we want is a, it's a default syslog message, so we can extract the time and date. The host name is there as well. And then we, um, we extract uh, the application name, the program name, uh, and we just record the log message. Now, we might have a, have a tool that is monitoring the same application, uh, and then the application name, name is not going to match, but we want to, to have that log message uh, for our application as well. So we can use a basic um, regular expression to extract the application name and still have it in the same rule set. Then in the decoding phase, we're going to have more, uh, more information extracted. So this is just a basic login message. Um, and again, you see we use uh, regular expressions to define which fields we want. Um, and with the order tag, we give meaning to that, uh, to that information. In the analysis phase, um, we're going to create rules. So we know it's uh, decoded in the pre-decoding uh, phase as uh, app daemon in this case. And we're going to look for, uh, for a string called logged in. And uh, that means that the user is uh, correctly log logged in. And based on the, on the first rule, you see that every rule has a rule ID. Um, and by reusing the, the rule ID in the, in the next rule, you can um, create a chain of rules. So here we have, uh, if, if the user is not John, we will uh, throw, the, throw the message Okay, this was not John. Um, based on the source IP, we can uh, match it to, to a CIDR notation of the, of the network. If in our current policy it's not allowed to, to access a certain host from a certain network, um, we can throw alert, an alert on that as well. By building rules uh, like that, you, you can really create a flexible um, rule tree and have actions taken um, on certain events. And that really makes it a, a really flexible tool to, to man manage all the log uh, that is coming in instead of looking at, at it uh, when the event has already happened. 
if you're going to build rules, um, you're going to have um, regular expressions. The problem with uh, the, the, the real regular expressions on a, in an IDS situation, you may not want um, the extens extensive features. You want to have speed, because you want to have the, the messages interpreted as, as fast as possible. So um, the OSSEC team has decided to, to build uh, a reg regex library um, for the decoders and the rules. There is two libraries. This is the first one, which is a very extensive, uh, a more extensive one. Um, and you can build your rules very flexible that way. And then there is a second one, uh, which is actually only used in the rules, and it's the simplest that you can have. You can just look for a string, uh, and then you can have multiple strings chained with the, with the pipe. And this is the fastest one. It's the best to use. And for integrity checking, um, OSSEC.conf is the basic configuration file where you do all the configuration for your host. Um, in the, in the syscheck section, you just define which, um, which directories you want to uh, include to have the um, integrity checking. It's very important um, I, for me, if, if I configure it uh, on systems, I always take the, 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 the lowest in the hierarchy or the highest in the hierarchy and then you're going to exclude lower in the hierarchy. Because if you um, do, the, do the monitoring too high, you might miss something, while well, you can still exclude files or directories that you don't want to monitor. And those are mainly uh, files and directories that you know change a lot. You don't want to have uh, alerts thrown on those. Since uh, version 2.2, um, there's also, also a, a real-time check. In the past, it was run, like you see on top, um, in a in a defined uh, pattern, so every, every few hours you could have it run. Uh, now you can have certain directories that are high risk also monitored um, in real time. Then in the, in the rules, you're going to con configure rules for your, um, for your applications, uh, for, for, your, for your files. And these are the basic rules that are in the OSIC uh, configuration to, to monitor uh, file changes on your systems. Like I said before, you can use then those um, to create actions, maybe to, to block a user if he, if he has crea uh, created the file or, uh, or changed the file, um, or just put the original file back so you maintain integri integrity. There's a, a lot of commands that you can use on the, on the server to check um, the integrity. The syscheck update is just um, updating the database. Uh, that's not that's done automatically, but every every few hours, if you want to have the situation updated now, you can use that command. Um, with the sister control minus L, uh, you're going to get a list of the um, of the agents. My, my, minus I is just going to give you from a certain um, client all the files that have changed. After after a short while, it will already be a long, a very long list. Um, if you're looking for a specific file, you can use that uh, last command. Then the management of OSSEC. Um, at this moment, it all hap happens from the command line. Um, there have been, uh, th there is a, a basic web user interface that you can use. If you're going to have a lot of um, a lot of server, it's not very, uh, it's not very very well developed at this moment. Um, I mainly use OSSEC to create meaning to the, to the messages, but that, then they're going to be forwarded to something like Splunk um, to really create in, uh, dashboards or information, ma make it vi visual. So on the command line, you have manage agents, and there's two versions on it. If you compile it in the, in the server version, you're going to be able to create central keys, um, and you're going to have a central database of keys. Then on the agent side, the basic functionality is there to import the key. And that, that's it. Um, agent control, that's your uh, main tool to control all the behavior of the agents. Minus LC is going to give you the, um, the list of the clients that are currently connected. Um, and minus I, agent ID is going to give you the information on the client, which is um, the, the OS version, IP address, um, 
And if you're going to use central configuration, which I will explain uh, a little later, um, you will also see the, the MD5 hash of the central configuration file, so you can compare it uh, and see that it's up to date. Um, min minus small r a is gonna um, do the system check and the, uh, the integrity check and the um, rootkit detection check on the um, on all the agents minus r, and then provided with the agent ID is gonna restart an agent and minus r minus u. Um, with the agent ID is going to do the system check on a specific agent. I didn't include central configuration in my slides, uh, but I want to explain it a little bit. Uh, you have the possibility to create a central uh, configuration file for all your agents, and that's going to be pushed to the agent every uh, two or three hours. Now, um, in, in, in that configuration file, you can either specify uh, specific con configurations based on the, um, on the ID of the agents. So if you have three web servers, you include uh, in the specific rules for those clients uh, the IDs of those, of those agents. Or you can create a configuration file based on the operating system. So for Solaris or Linux or uh, AIX, you can create different, uh, different rule sets. Basic conclusion, um, if you're going to do log management from a corporate point of view, uh, you're going to get a reseller coming in with a, with a solution, a proprietary solution. And you're going to have two or three consultants at your, um, at your office for a few months. The problem is they don't know your applications, they don't know your environment. The only one that knows your environment and your applications is yourself. Um, if you're going to start with OSEC, you will have the time to um, create rules based on your environment and not on what the proprietary solution um, offers. OSEC, being developed uh, since before 2005, is a very mat mature solution to use. Uh, it's, it's very stable and it offers a lot of uh, functionality for you to, to start your log management. As I said, log management is something that has become uh, necessary due to regulatory compliance. If you're going to do log management, um, you better start by understanding your logs yourself. One thing to remember um, is that tuning the rules uh, of any log management solution will never stop. Um, so you can create log, um, your rules now. In a few months, you will have to uh, redo them and see whether it still fits your solution. Um, it's a lot of work, but it's worth it, I think. So um, that was my overview of OSEC. I, thought, I hope you found it a little bit interesting. And if there's any questions, Yes, um, I, I understand that uh, the problem with UDP is the re reliability because you have no confirmation. Uh, the intelligence um, is built in the agent and the server. So when your, agent, uh, when your server fails, your agent will, uh, will queue the messages and send them when the server is available again. I'm going, I'm going to walk up to you. So, so you're asking if, the, if there's a redundancy built in? Yes, you can just deploy two or more servers. Yeah. And have one client, not to several servers. Um, that, that, is, that is not possible. What, what you can do, uh, you can have um, multiple servers. You can have one agent um, with keys for several servers. Uh, it needs some extensive configuration. And uh, in, in my opinion, does this still work? Not from here? Wait, better. Um, I think there's uh, two main courses for um, uh, re reliability, um, for redundance. 
you can have um, two servers and have the agent point to the two different servers, then you will have to synchronize the keys between the two servers. Um, that's uh, one, one solution. The problem is, since there is already um, reliability in the, in the agent, agent side, if your uh, service is gonna, going down, the, the agent will keep the messages until the service is uh, available, available again. And build, building a server is really, a, is really very easy. So uh, bas basically, you have a server installed in about 20 minutes. Um, it's better to have a backup of your keys and rebuild than have one server running, doing nothing in case maybe the server will crash. But you, have the, you have the possibility to make redundant servers. I haven't used that possibility yet. Either you yell or I come to you. Uh, yeah, um, the, the agent is currently supported on Windows from uh, 95 to Windows 7. Um, it's um, supported on AIX, on Solaris, uh, and on most flavors of, uh, of, of Linux. Excuse me? Yes. Um, Yes, um, one second. There is the MS um, regarding authentic authentication. Um, there is uh, the DAC DACP rules at this moment. Um, what is the agent distribution method? Um, for the installation of the, of the agent, uh, basically it's a, it's a simple install. Uh, the inst For, for the configuration or no in in most cases there, there isn't a distribution package for 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 all for all um, um, OSs so it's a it's a basic install and normally I create a package uh, for, for the for the customer when ba based on the OS that he's using right now I'm busy with a project uh, in, involving Solaris and AIX so I created the basic pa packages for those We have 50 minutes left. <laughs> no more questions. <laughs> hmm? 20 minutes. Oh, yeah. I talk too fast. Uh, yes. Uh, one one OS X server uh, can have about 250 clients. Yeah. It, it depends on, on, on the memory you have, on the storage that you have, and on your, uh, on your network card and the speed of your network. So that's, that's different in every environment. Yes. Excuse me? Yeah, um, for, for, for the file integrity? Um, it it uh, records the MD5 and the SHA-1 hash of the, of the file. No, at this, at this moment, no. But it's open source application, so if you want to contribute, you can do that. Mm -hmm. Wait. Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. about 20,000 on a university network. Yeah. How would you scale it? Because monitoring 50, 60, 70 or sex servers to see what happens isn't efficient. Yeah. It's more efficient than monitoring 20,000 servers, but... No, you're, you're, you're going to have a tiered approach. If, if you have that, that, many, that, many ser um, that many clients or that many log sources, um, you're going to have uh, a tiered approach. You're going to have your basic OSX la layer, then you're going to have 
um, another layer of, uh, of, of syslog servers. And then in the end, you're gonna, for your storage, you're going to have uh, a central storage. Thank you.